In round four of the Tata Steel Chess Tournament, there was an eagerly anticipated clash. World champion Magnus Carlsen played against the 17-year-old Chinese prodigy Wei Yi. After three rounds, both these players had two out of three. But I tell you, Wei Yi is so far very impressive. Two solid draws and his victory in round three against Nippon Nishi was absolutely brilliant. So what would Magnus make of the 17-year-old in round four? He spent a lot of his career playing against players older than himself. He was always the younger one battling against the, the older experienced players. But now the boot is on the other foot. What would he make of the Chinese prodigy? So Carlson with the white pieces. Now in round one, where Yi played this solid Petrov variation and he clearly understands this opening very well. So Magnus today played an anti-Petrov variation, bishop c4. But after this, actually, the game reached pretty orthodox lines, the kind of position that Magnus is very familiar with. So it's very much like a Gioco Piano or, well, actually, it's a kind of Spanish. It transposes into a kind of Spanish. The pawn structure, almost symmetrical. We've seen Magnus play these kind of positions very, very often, almost symmetrical pawn structure. but. You could argue that white has a very, very slight advantage because this bishop is slightly more active than that bishop. But trying to make something of this, of course, is very, very difficult. So very normal position so far. Now where he went for a, quite a provocative plan, actually. First of all, he attacked this bishop. This bishop, of course, needs to be kept. And then he played bishop g4. Now, when I'm playing the Spanish, this is the kind of move I really like to see because this gives white a target. We want to spin this knight round and then chase this bishop away, either sometimes with knight to e3, sometimes knight g3 and h3 and even g4 sometimes. So but it's very provocative because when this move g4 comes, then this knight is often in an excellent position to spin round into the f4 square. Well, let's see how this works out in practice. After the game, Magnus said that he looked at knight f1 straight away with this idea, knight e3. And if bishop h5, then this typical idea to chase down this bishop, even if it gives this square away, well, this knight has a superb square on f5. But he said what he was concerned about was in this position, black would be able to exchange here and then just play g6 to shut out this knight. And on, on the next turn, bishop g5 with potentially later on an exchange of bishops. And he thought, well, white's very difficult to prove an advantage with white there, but not well, possible. But instead he went for h3 and only then knight f1, this absolutely typical maneuver of the knight. Sometimes it'll go to e3, sometimes to g3. Again, white is trying to chase down this bishop, sometimes knight g3, sometimes with g4. So knight d7, so this allows this bishop to have influence over these squares. And now Magnus went for g4. And the knight backed up the g-pawn, knight g3. So looking at the f5 square, but there are certain weaknesses in white's position now. This is very, very double-edged. Knight g5. And here, Magnus thought for 20 minutes. So what was going on in his head during those 20 minutes? This is very typical of him. Often he plays very quickly, but there are certain moments in the game where he goes into the tank and swims around trying to find the right strategy. And this was one of those moments. 
So what was he thinking of? Well, this move, he said after the game, was occupying his thoughts a great deal. He was very intrigued by this pawn sacrifice. So, well, lots of possibilities here for black, but, but the, the chief idea is this. Sorry, excuse me. Um, black takes on f5 first. You need to do that. The knight comes back. And now white gets pretty serious play on the h file. But coming back here, black does have other possibilities. The knight could perhaps go to f4. This gets exchanged and then white takes on e7 and then tries to recover this pawn. So white should be doing okay there as well. But the reason that Magnus didn't want to go in for this was actually he thought that instead of taking this pawn that black would take on f5 first, decline the pawn sacrifice and just exchange these bishops and actually with only one file open black is actually pretty strong on the king side. He thought that well, when white tries to attack on the g file the king will just step to the side, the rook can easily defend this pawn, and then black will play in the centre. And this knight is a beautiful piece. Can't be budged at all, and yeah, this bishop actually isn't so special. So, well, an, an intriguing moment in the game, but he said he was sorely tempted by this move knight f5. Instead, he went for bishop g5, taking off he giving up his dark squared bishop, something he didn't really want to do, and he wasn't really terribly impressed by his own play, um, because this bishop now finds this very nice square on f4. But at least Magnus has been able to push forward in the middle of the board. So knight e2, the knight attacks the bishop, very important to, to challenge that bishop. On the plus side of, of white's position, you could say that the bishop is not very well placed on g6. It's rather been shut out of the game. But still, two bishops are two bishops, and, and white has to challenge that bishop on f4. So the queen comes to f6, protecting the bishop. Black doesn't want to have to recapture with the pawn. Now Magnus just brings the king up to protect these pieces. And here where Yi thought for almost 20 minutes, he, he had his big think here, um, and he came up with pawn takes pawn, and well, as Magnus said after the game, he said this was a gift. He, had, he said, I have no idea why he played this. Giving up the centre is, um, well, strategically you have to have something in compensation for that. Uh, Magnus thought that possibly h5 could be played, um, but perhaps the most reliable move here is simply rook e8. Absolutely typical move to put a bit more pressure on white centre without releasing the tension. But it seems like uh, the Magnus effect has struck again. Um, so Wei Yi gave up the center. Knight takes d4, and yeah, Magnus said he was sort of reasonably optimistic around here. Now rook e8, and now very important to grab that bishop and f3. So. Carlson has been able to support his important central point. Now, this queen is has some potential, but the problem is that actually black can't back it up with any of his pieces. I mean, one possibility might be to play d5 here to, to break things open, but, well, I think Magnus would get a, a, a very typical um, endgame advantage after this, for example and then exchange off that. And here, Magnus has a good knight against a bad bishop. That's just the kind of position that he, he excels in. 
Instead, where you played Knight B6, perhaps he was beginning to realise that things things weren't so rosy. Um, and now a very important move, Queen C1 to, to trade off queens. Well, the queen can step back, but ah, yes, in that case, F4 and F5 actually wins the bishop. So black has to trade here. And this already strategically is a lot of fun for white just because of the, the space advantage. Black is rather cramped behind the first two ranks. If black sits there, for example, f6, well, white has a wonderful bind on black's position. Just the kind of position that, that uh, Magnus likes. Reminds me rather of Magnus's fantastic victory in the World Championship match against Carlsen um, that, that uh, leveled the scores with with uh, two rooks and the knights on the board. But where he decided to, to break in the middle straight away, and well, here's an, another very important moment in the game where, where Magnus had a, a few options. Um, one move that he said he was very intrigued by was bishop here with the idea of sacrificing a pawn to, to shut this bishop out of the game. But, well, as he said, at some point that bishop can actually enter the game off king f8 and bishop g8 and later on f6. And a pawn is a pawn. Um, he was also wondering about taking here, and but the knight just gets into the game too quickly. But he realised that actually if he pushes on, this pawn majority on the king's side is actually really potent. Knight d7. Well, this is Yi's idea. Um, he wanted to attack this pawn, and after Carlson defends the pawn, this is the game, he brought his knight to c5, and he obviously thought that this knight coming into this important central square would give him sufficient play. But, actually, this is a very, very difficult position. Notice the difference between the two kings. This king can easily back up this wonderful pawn majority. And this is a very difficult position. Um, if a5, for example, then white can just start pressing on the king side with his pawns. So when you put his knight in the middle, it looks very impressive. But actually, um, white can just play around this knight. Now, he was clearly hoping for c4, trying to undermine the knight. Then the knight would come back and the rooks will come into play. But instead, Carlson appreciated the danger and played b4 first. I mean, this is so like his win against uh, Karyakin in, to, in the World Championship match. It's incredible. Um, in that game, he, Carlson also secured the c5 square with, with this pawn b4. And now Carlson thought afterwards that, that the best way to play would be f6, but of course after e6 you know, this gives white um, a, a wonderful pass pawn, but at least this knight has a square here, but white would still have to fight to win this game. But instead g5 was played and okay, it looks kind of dangerous to, to try and undermine this pawn here, but actually because white's king is so far up the board can always support this pawn on e5. And c4 is an excellent move. In this case, undermining the knight is very strong. And here, you know, white very often can exchange and try to enter with the rook into the position. And this is such a dangerous position. This knight also has the f5 square available. And black is in massive trouble here. Where you tried c5, but actually this goes from bad to worse. Um, perhaps he was, e even knight f5 is good here, but Carlsen finds the absolute best move. Knight b5, and, and this threatens all kinds of nasty things with knight c7, nasty knight forks, and, and black is absolutely, absolutely lost here. And of course this knight is being undermined. Now that the c pawn has moved from c6, the knight is being undermined. Black is, is just lost here. The game ended G takes f4, king takes f4, 
it's still a threat to take here and knight c7 where ye played c takes b4 c takes d5 and here the Chinese player resigned uh, the knight is in desperate trouble uh, it has to play to c3 but after this Carlson is going to take this pawn he's uh, well a, a clear pawn up with this massive pawn center black is utterly lost and where ye just resigned there so uh, an absolutely convincing victory uh, by Carlson um, and well he showed Wei Yi he still got a few tricks to learn yet so yeah brilliant victory from Carlson he seems to be gathering speed in Tata Steel 2017